So to start with the blockchain talk, I was wondering, who of you have heard about Bitcoin? Raise your hand. And who of those people have actually bought Bitcoins or maybe mined them? A couple of you. And who of you has ever thought about you could use the technology of Bitcoin, the blockchain, for other things than just Bitcoin? Okay, very nice, very nice. So my name is Mark van Kuyk, and I'm working for InfoSupport as a blockchain technology expert. And today I want to ask a couple of questions for you. First of all, what is a blockchain? How does a blockchain fit in a software architecture? Because a blockchain is never a thing on its own. And when would it be appropriate to, to look into blockchain in a, for a project of yours? One of the interesting things about blockchains, and if I take Bitcoin for an example, what we want to achieve there is, in Bitcoin, we want to transfer money from one person to another person without relying on a central party like a bank. In our current system, we need a bank. We trust the bank, they run the software, we trust that they do everything correctly. But if you want to remove that level of trust, you need a different system, a peer-to-peer -peer system. And you need to solve a problem how can you do this? A very naive way to start is let's model coins and banknotes as files. But then I can copy a file and give it to you, and I can copy the same file and send it to you. So we want some way to find out that you did not copy this file. So this approach is not going to work. I'm going to tell you what a blockchain is, and I'm going to introduce five ingredients that will be there in every blockchain. The first one is a state machine. And in a state machine, you have a couple of, of components. You have a, a state where you start in, it's the initial state, and you have messages going into the state machine, and you have a transition function that takes an in a state and a message, and it will progress into a new state. So to make it concrete, you see here an example where both the message and the state are integers or numbers. The initial state, we say we have a value of zero, and the message of value seven comes in, and our transition function just adds the two values. So if we apply this function, we will go into a new state with the value seven. And we can repeat this over and over again. So when we send in a message with value minus five, we sum the two, we come to two. Now in blockchain, we have extended this concept of the state machine a little bit. We've added a validation function, which acts on the same two input parameters, a, a state, the current state, and a message, but it will output a Boolean value, a yes or a no. It will say this message is valid and allowed to, uh, to be acted upon in the current state. So if we take as validation function one that says the message, the value must, must be higher than the value that is in the current state, then in this case, seven is higher than zero, so it's okay. So the value seven flows to the transition function and it is applied, so we go forward. Now if the message minus five comes in, it is smaller than seven, so this one is blocked. The message 16, 16 is higher than 7, so this one is allowed. Now, if you think about this in, for example, a money transfer context, what would this, what would this be? The validation function checks whether, um, one step back, the state contains information about balances for accounts. So it would say, in the account of Mark is seven euros, and in the account of Jean is 12 euros. And then a message would say, I want to transfer five euros from the account of Mark to the account of Jean. Now this validation function then can say, this is not allowed if there are less than five euros in the account of Mark. So it will say no, and it will not be executed. Now in this case it is, so the transition function will be executed, will, which will remove five euros from the account of Mark and add five euros to the account of Jean. So this is our first ingredient. The next one we need is a distributed network. I've created one here, there are four nodes, and they're separated in uh, different persons or different organizations. So it's not that one organization is running a cluster of nodes like you would do 
uh, with, for example, a Cassandra cluster. And here, this is actually distributed across organizations or persons. We need those nodes to communicate, so let's add some lines. And we need to be able to pass messages from one node to the other node. But we don't need to be fully connected because nodes can forward those messages. So when a message is sent from the left topmost uh, uh, node to the one at the right top, it can forward it to, to the bottom right. So messages don't, uh, you don't need to connect everything to everything. Now let's get our previous ingredient and put it in here. Every node runs a state machine by itself. And thus exactly the same thing as every other node. So in here, you can see the state machine running in all the nodes, just as we have seen before. And now let's say someone inserts this message minus five into a node. This message is now distributed across the network, and each node by itself will run the validation function, and we'll see, no, this one is not valid. The 16 comes in, maybe at a different node. It was forwarded across the network, and every node for itself can now see the 16 is valid and will progress into the next state. This is one of the ingredients we need because now you need only to trust your own node. You do not need to trust what everybody else is doing. If they are going to screw up, make mistakes, or actually try to do things differently, not by the rules of the games, they will end up in a different state. But you can trust your own, your own node. But this is not enough. Let's say the following happens. These two nodes, they're maybe geographically separated, and both have a new message, 29 and 72. Let's see what happens in this case. They start forwarding, but we don't know what actually should happen, because some nodes will receive the 29 first, and other nodes will receive the 72 first. So let's take a look at what happens inside this node. We were at state Q2. The message 72 comes in. The node will decide 72 is larger than 23. This is OK. So we progress to the next state. We now we sum them up to 95. And we see the new message, 29, is not valid. So OK, this is what we do. But let's take a look at what this node is doing. It will first see the message 29. So 29 is larger than 23, that's okay, we continue, we are on 52. Now 72 comes in, which is larger, larger than 52, so we progress into a state where the value is 124. Now we have a difference. So here we need a new ingredient, and that's consensus. All those nodes, all around the world, or maybe just in one country, doesn't really matter, they need to achieve consensus on which of those two progresses is going to be the truth. Which of is the one we will assume is OK, and which is the one we should discard? Now, there are several consensus algorithms. And for those of you who know Bitcoin, the part of mining, what we also call proof of work, is, is one of those implementations. But there are others. I'm not going to dive too deep into those, uh, because we don't have too much time. But I'm going to show you two classes of consensus algorithms. The first class is a lottery type. And in a lottery type, what we roughly do is we assign lottery tickets to all nodes. And the exact algorithm we choose decides how those tickets are distributed. And then one of them is going to win. Let's say this ticket. And what it means when this node has the winning tickets, is that this node can say, OK, this is what I believe is true, and I'm going to send it to you, and you are now also going to believe this is true. So another node might have thought this is exactly what, what is going on. That's OK. He will just, nothing will change. But another node that has at first decided on a different ordering will now refer to what he thought and will agree on this is the correct ordering. So from this point on, we all agree what is the, the real truth. For those of you who know Bitcoin, we do this by mining. And actually, you could see every hash you try is one of those tickets. But there are other ways you could do this. You could, for example, say every euro you have in the system, you get a ticket. 
So those that have the most euros have the highest probability of proposing a new state to go forward. The other class of algorithms is for voting. It's a voting style. And this one is not really suitable for uh, uh, systems or blockchains that are used where everybody can join. But if you're using a blockchain where you have a group of participants and you know who are participating, you can use this style. And then you can say, someone is, is going to propose. Let's say this one. And the exact algorithm decides who it is. It could be always the same. It could be round robin. It could depend on something else. But then this party is going to propose a new state to move forward, an ordering of messages to move forward. And he's going to propose this onto the network. Everybody who sees this proposal then stamps it and say, I agree. And now if the majority agrees with the way forward, then we all assume this. So in this case, if only two of them say, I agree on this uh, uh, state, and the two others say, I agree on this state, we could get a split. But two is not a majority if we have four participants. So if you have three um, uh, participants saying, this is how we move forward, then you can say, OK, this is what I, what I accept. There are some advantages and disadvantages for choosing either of them. Uh, if you're interested in learning more of them, uh, come, uh, come to me after this talk. OK, so now we have consensus. It's our third ingredient. But consensus is a process that takes time. It takes resources. And if for every transaction we want to reach consensus, for every message going into the blockchain, we would have to do a hell of a job. And this would be the bottleneck in our blockchain. So the next ingredient, what we, uh, what we need, is a chain of blocks. We're going to group those messages in blocks. And you can see it in this way. We start at a zero, and messages are flowing into the system. And at some point, we're going to say, now we're going to do this consensus algorithm. We reach consensus on a block, and this block contains a list of messages. And while we do this consensus algorithm, new messages can flow in in any node. And you just queue them up. And when the next round of consensus starts, um, you pick this new uh, list, this new set of uh, messages, and you vote on them. Now, if you also add in every of those blocks an, the hash of the previous block, uh, and the cryptographic hash like a, a SHA function, then you get another property. You cannot change anything in the past anymore, because if you would do so, the hash of your block changes. And therefore, on the next block, you will not have a valid value pointing to you. So with this, we have a history of messages, which cannot be changed afterwards anymore. And we have the same transition function and validation function everywhere. So if you start at the first block, and go over them all one by one, you will end up at the exact same state as every other participant in the network, without needing to trust any individual other party. So now we have four ingredients. We need one more ingredient, because in this blockchain we created now, there's one thing I could do which Jean would not like. I could insert a message into the network sending five euros from her account to mine. I would like, but then I know someone else can take it back from me again, so. We need authorization. And authorization is in two parts, reading and writing. The reading part, in principle, is very simple. Everybody sees everything. And this is a logical consequence of the fact that all the messages are propagated through the entire network and everybody runs the same node. So you need to see all the messages. Otherwise, you cannot validate whether or not in there is enough balance, for example. This is true. However, there are some solutions. And two of them are being investigated at, at, at this, uh, in this time. And one of them is using some advanced cryptographics. For example, there is a project that is trying to see if they, and they actually succeeded, if they can make a modified version of Bitcoin where you can hide the amount so it is encrypted in such a way that you can still be sure that you are not spending Bitcoins 
or currency that is not yours, that you have never received before. But nobody can see how much, how much you own, how much you are sending to someone. And this is, uh, they use homomorphic encryption for this. Uh, other uh, technologies that people are looking into is zero knowledge proof. But this is really the dark magic of cryptography. Another solution you could choose is to look into hardware. And this is something that Intel has done, for example. Intel is creating the processes, the CPUs of your computers. Um, and inside some of those CPUs, they have created something uh, which they call SGX technology. And it is an enclave where you can send encrypted data in. Inside the CPU, it is decrypted. A program can run. The output is encrypted again before it is sent to, to your RAM memory. So even if you put, uh, uh, I'm going to measure what happens on the pin of the processor, you will never see the unencrypted value. And also your application and your operating system is unable to see this. So using those kinds of technologies, you can build uh, privacy in a blockchain, but you need to rely on Intel being honest in some level. The other side is writing, and this is a, fair, a, a problem which is actually solved. We use asymmetric, asymmetric cryptography for it. You have a public and a private key. Using a private key, you can create a signature and put it with a message. And then the receiver, having the public key, is able to verify that this signature is actually created using your private key and not by someone else. Now, if you have here this message saying, I want to send five euros from the account of Gene to the account of Mark, then the validate, validation function needs to check two things. One, the signature is actually valid, and two, the public key or the private key used to generate the signature is actually allowed to send funds from the account of Gene. And the private key I have is not allowed to do so. I can only send funds from the account of Mark. So now we have five ingredients with which we can create a blockchain. We have the state machine, which consists of a validation function and a transition function. We have a distributed network, such that every participant can run its own node, runs its own copy of the state machine. We reach consensus using some algorithm. And then we form a chain of blocks, and we use authorization to prevent anyone from doing whatever he is not allowed to do. I wanted to prepare a demo using a Java blockchain, but um, due to some time constraints and, and uh, unexpected events, I was unable to finish it. But to not let you down too much, I can show you a different um, one, which is using Ethereum. And I'm going to mirror my screen so I can just look on my own machine. What we've created here is a network where some people can generate power, for example, using solar panels. Other people are using power. This is Dutch, by the way. And here are some meters uh, uh, that measure the amount of kilowatt hour that is flowing through this wire. And we wanted to create a network where we don't need to rely on any trusted third party. We don't want to use a web server somewhere. We don't want one of those participants to run a, a centralized database where, that everybody needs to check to, to trust. So what we created, uh, we used a blockchain for this. Now, in those segments, the, the, these two blocks, they need to sum up to zero. So the amount of energy that is flowing in must equal the amount of energy flowing out. And if that is not the case, then some things could be happening. Either there is a malfunctioning thing where electricity is uh, lost due to um, decay in cables, for example, or someone is uh, attaching uh, a line to, their, to, to this cable, stealing electricity that is not theirs, or someone is tampering their meter. But in any way, if those values do not sum, do not sum up to zero, then something is wrong, and you can start investigating. Now, I don't have the real meters in here, but I first have to... Oh, oh shit. Uh, 
I first start the consensus algorithm. It is taking quite some uh, CPU power, so I only run it when I'm actually doing this presentation. And now what I can do is for this meter, which has registered 80 kilowatt hours before, I'm now going, to, or 86, I'm now going to set it to 80. And what we will see that is happening is that the system will notice it is no longer zero and an alarm can be raised. And the interesting thing about this blockchain is that every participant which has one of those meters can run its own copy of the blockchain and every one of them will by themselves come to the conclusion that there is a problem and the problem is in this segment. And now we don't really know what is wrong, but at least everybody who is participating here can go and see um, start an investigation, and that's something that you can probably do collectively. So let's go back to our presentation. Very good. So this was j just a small example. Now, when you're creating a blockchain, your blockchain will always be part of a bigger thing. So in the example I just demonstrated, there is a blockchain that uh, stores the kilowatt hours that has been measured, that is able to uh, say at this point is a problem, Th the measurements don't add up, but that's just one part of it. Outside of it, you build um, uh, the measurements, you need to inject them into the blockchain, maybe you want a graphical user interface, etc. So to answer this question, I'm going to take CQRS as a starting point. And as a reminder, or for those who don't uh, remember CQRS, CQRS is um, command and query responsibility segregation. So reading and writing a system is something different. So on the left side of the system boundary here, we see a system, and on the right side, we see a user interacting with the system, which could be a person or it could be a different system. When this person wants to read, know something about the current state, he's going to ask the top surface a question, which will use the database uh, to answer this question. Now, this, this can be, for example, a Cassandra cluster. It is optimized to very quickly answer read questions. But when he wants to change something, he sends a request to a different surface on the bottom side. And here is some business logic involved. Uh, you can do authorization, authentication, uh, input validation, all the old stuff, and see whether everything is OK. And then you write something into a database. And this database is then uh, informing another service, uh, or the service is another service is querying this database and transform th this into such a way that the reading side can very quickly give answers again to questions. Now, if this lower database is just a journal, a journal where you add those commands that are happening, end them at the end, and never change anything before it anymore, then what we created is event sourcing. The interesting thing about event sourcing is if for whatever reason you want to rebuild the top part or you want to scale it out, one naive and simple way to do is just start reading the journal from the beginning, run it through the surface that is drawn on the left, and you will come up with the same database at the top in the end. So this journal is an, is an event log and it is append only. So to show it, this is the state machine we've seen before. If you see how this maps to a journal, this is what you store in the journal, only the messages. And that's very interesting, because we've seen this before. It looks a bit like the input to the blockchain. So this journal we could replace with a blockchain. And what we then get is a system where we can put messages into, events, messages, transactions, they now all are just the same thing. They go into this, this blockchain. The blockchain distributes us over the network. And when consensus is reached about the messages, then the blockchain could uh, output this, and the surface on the left will be able to update the database on the top again. In fact, it is a bit more difficult because there is an extra database often involved. Uh, you want to do some administration. But this is the general picture. 
this is also how, for example, a Bitcoin wallet works. The balances that are actually showing, when you use the user interface to see what is your balance, this balance is not actually recorded in this form in the blockchain. So you transform it using the service on the left and store something in a local database that, that is just for you, for your person, for your organization, and the, the information that is relevant for you. And what is then stored in the blockchain are just those things that are needed to, in the future, validate whether new messages are valid and to move forward in this system. So now we've seen what a blockchain is, and we've seen at what place in an architecture you could put it. There's one final question I want to answer. When is a blockchain appropriately? Well, the simple answer is, in most cases, it is not. And what you see on the internet is a lot of people hyping about this technology and saying, oh, blockchain, this is the silver bullet and we're going to do, I don't know. But it is not always, and in most cases, not even a good solution or the best solution. There are five things you really need to answer, five questions you really need to answer with yes. And if all of those questions are answered with yes, then blockchain may be appropriate. If one of them is answered with no, then just find a different solution. So the first question, do you need a data store? If yes, okay, let's go to the next question. Are there multiple writers? If no, then just take a file on your hard disk or take an Oracle or a SQL Server database and put it in your organization and build a web service on top of it or a user interface and you're done. But those multiple writers, even this is not enough. They do not need to trust each other completely. If they fully trust each other, then I would say, well, maybe not, but go for a spreadsheet on Google Docs. But I do not trust everybody, especially not if it comes to my money or if, to other valuable things. So people may be honest, but I don't know. They may lie. Um, if this is all there is, there is a simple solution. You could pick a third party. Um, I don't know, for example, how it works in Poland, but in the Netherlands, if you want to transfer the ownership of a house, you go to a notary, you make a deed, and we all trust this notary. So we don't need a blockchain to store who owns which house. However, if there is a situation where you don't have such a third party that you can trust, or you don't want to trust, or for a political reason it is a difficult thing, then a blockchain may be appropriate. This could, for example, be in, in Bitcoin. We don't want to trust banks, but it could also be in international trade. For example, in Europe, if you pay with euros, you have like an hierarchy where we as consumers trust commercial banks, commercial banks trust the central bank, the European Central Bank, so that's okay. And in the States it's the same, on the top there is the Federal Reserve, and in the UK we have uh, the Bank of England. But if there is trade between those continents, there is nothing above the ECB. There is no global trusted party for money. So. In, in those, that's also why those payments are more expensive. Commercial banks are using other mechanisms to transfer funds across continents, across currencies. So in, in this example, a blockchain could be something that is moving forward. Or another situation could be uh, in international trade when uh, I want to import, as an importer, I want to import kiwis from New Zealand. I trust my bank here in our country, but I do not know all those banks in New Zealand. I do not know which one I want to trust. And the other way around, the exporter has the problem in the other way. And those banks don't trust each other also completely. Maybe a little bit, but not completely. So here, this is a very expensive process that's going on over there with letter of credits and stuff. And this is a place that may be solved with blockchain. But there is one more question we had to answer. I said there were five. I've only had seen four now. Is there an interaction between the transactions that you want to put into the blockchain? If no, then you may not need a blockchain. For example, here what we have seen is uh, this example with 16, 29, and 72 going into this state machine. And the ordering seemed to matter, because if you change the order, then one uh, message is no longer valid anymore. 
So there is some interaction between those. If this interaction does not exist, then what you could do, for example, is create a digital document, just put a signature on it, and that could be enough. So if, um, for example, I want to prove, or if I'm going to give someone an, a note with a claim, with a statement that they can get something for me, I can just put a signature on it, and then later on they can show this, this document with a signature and say, you have made this statement, I'm here to collect my claim. But if this claim can be invalidated by some other transaction, then a digital signature is no longer enough. So then you could say, oh, okay, let's take a look uh, at blockchain. So the five things, you need a database with multiple writers that do not fully trust each other. You don't, do not need to fully distrust each other, but also not fully trust each other. You do not have or want a trusted third party, and there is some level of interaction between messages. And if all those things apply, then I would say, uh, give me, give me a, a heads up, a call, and I'm really interested in uh, looking with you further if blockchain is still appropriate, and if yes, start a project with it. Are there any questions? Okay, the question, how can I run a blockchain on my computer? Well, one thing you can do is download Bitcoin and you have a blockchain running on your computer. If you want something more, um, what I always say is a very easy way to start is with Ethereum. And Ethereum is an open source blockchain. It's uh, written in, there's a client written in Go and one in C++. And there's also a Java one nowadays. And in Ethereum, you can create a network for yourself or you can c connect to a global network and you can actually start creating applications that run inside those nodes. So if you create an application which you run inside an Ethereum network, then whatever code is executed is executed on all those nodes and everybody will come to the same conclusion. So that's the easiest way to start programming with blockchain. If there are no more questions, I would like to thank you and wish you a pleasant stay today.